So I want you to imagine with me that you really like sushi. Now, I know for some of you that takes no imagination at all. And for some of you, that takes more imagination than you feel capable of this morning. But just ride with me. You really like sushi. And you have a friend, and you're hanging out, and you're like, hey, let's go get sushi. And they're like, "Eh, I don't like sushi. And you're like, come on. Sushi is great. Have you ever even tried sushi? Yeah, I tried it, and it was awful. And you're like, really? Where did you try it? And they describe some hole-in-the-wall place where when the sushi came out, the fish was still bloody. And uh, as soon as they took a bite into it, they bit straight into a bone that chipped their tooth. And that's their sushi experience. What would you be thinking? You'd be thinking, you, you, like, that doesn't even qualify as sushi. Like, I'm sorry, that was an abomination. I apologize on behalf of sushi lovers everywhere. You need to come try the real thing. You need to taste and see how good it really is. Imagine yourself in that position. And then maybe you'd understand a little bit of how I feel preparing this sermon this week. Because today we're going to be, as we're just continuing through our normal study of Philippians, we're going to be coming to a passage that uh, makes us ask, what does the Bible teach about generosity? Uh, what does the Bible teach about giving? And, and there's a lot of people that you, you, you think of that and you think, oh, I've had a bad experience. Because unfortunately, there are many people in our society, in our world, that pervert the scriptures. And even specifically scriptures like we will look at today into some get rich scheme. And you think, I don't want any part of that. And that's where I'm saying that's like the bloody sushi with the bone in it. Like that's, that's not the real thing. That's a perversion of it. That's an abomination is what that is. But then don't swear off sushi for life. Go get the real thing. Hey, don't swear off generosity and giving. Go see what the Bible actually says about these things. Taste and see. It's actually so good. What the Bible teaches about generosity and giving isn't something that we need to step back from because false teachers have twisted it and perverted it. It's something that we need to dig into. What does the Bible really say about this? So let's see what the Bible says. Please open up with me to Philippians chapter 4. We're almost done with the book of Philippians. And today we'll be looking at Philippians 4, 14 through 19. And as you're turning there, last week we saw in verse 10 how the Philippians clearly had sent Paul a gift uh, to take care of his needs because he was uh, under kind of a house arrest situation as a prisoner in Rome. And he had to provide for his own means, which is kind of hard to work a job when you're chained to a soldier. Uh, So they are providing for his needs. And last week, Paul started on that topic, but then kind of got off on the uh, topic of contentment. Now he's going to come back. And let's look at what he says in Philippians 4, 14 through 19. He says, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the things, the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So there you you see what he says and you see how it starts with just his statement. It was kind of you. You did well to share, to, to have fellowship with me in my trouble by sending this gift that you sent. And then he not only thanks them for their gift, he reviews their history. So this, and this isn't the first time you guys have helped me. He goes back to what he calls the beginning of the gospel. And what does that mean? Well, he's just saying, hey, Philippians, as soon as you heard the gospel and believed it, from the beginning of all of that, you've helped me out. The first time we see Paul going to the city of Philippi is in Acts chapter 16. And 
in there, he is thrown into jail, but people still get saved in the midst of all that. But he pretty quickly has to leave town. And as he leaves town, he goes to Thessalonica, and then he gets out of the region of Macedonia and moves on to uh, Athens and Corinth. And even in 2 Corinthians, he's talking to the church in Corinth, and he says, when I was with you and was in need, I didn't burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. He's probably talking about the Philippians there. And that's what he's saying. When I left Macedonia, you guys You entered into partnership with me. You guys supported me. And then in verse 16, he says, even in Thessalonica. So then he's saying, even before I could get out of Macedonia, Thessalonica, that was the very next city I went to. Even there, you provided for my needs once and twice. Again, you provided for me. He's recounting this history. Now, there were times where Paul had to work uh, to support himself in ministry. But even he writes that that's not the ideal. First Corinthians 9, he talks about the laborer deserves his wages. It's good if someone is really focused on gospel ministry for them to be free to do that and, and to focus their energies on that. And here he's in a situation in house arrest where he cannot provide for himself, but they are doing it. What you would see when you consider the history Paul discusses here, you see how Paul's ministry was enabled by generosity. Paul was able to do what he did because of the generosity of others. And if you really study the history of Christianity and and churches and missions, you'll see that that's how it works. People bringing the gospel overseas, yes, they were courageous and bold, but they were enabled by generous people providing for them to be able to do what they did. That is how God has designed the church to work. Point number one this morning, see the beautiful necessity of generosity. See the beautiful necessity of generosity. This is how God has designed the church to be provided for. He doesn't just rain down gold on Christians uh, to to provide for ministry. He doesn't hide hidden messages in the Bible about where treasures are hidden and go find them. And that's how you'll fund your ministry, even though that sounds like it could be the plot line of a really bad, cheesy Christian movie. That's not how God has designed it to work. God has designed, well, when ministry needs to be done, God's people will be generous and provide. Go all the way back to the Old Testament, Exodus. Hey, it's time to build the tabernacle. God didn't just poof, there it is. No, he caused the people to generously give for that. When when he said, okay, we're going to set aside one of the tribes. They're not going to get their own land and and work the land like everyone else is. They are going to be devoted to uh, the priestly ministry, the Levites. How are we going to take care of them? Well, we'll take a tithe from uh, the nation to take care of the tribe of the Levites. It was designed by the generosity of God's people. And you see that still today in both formal and informal ways. Formally, you see it through things like the local church. Uh, Look around you this morning at the people you see, at the things that you see. It's all enabled by the generosity of God's people. That's how this works. We don't have some revenue stream of, of things that were products that we're making. I mean, we sell some books and some other things in the back, and we do all that at cost so that it can be a resource for you. The church is provided for by the generosity of its people. I remember when I started in full time ministry, I was talking to some of my new neighbors, and I started in full time ministry right at the tail end back in those days of the Great Recession. And we were talking about the economy and how bad it was and how that was affecting everybody's jobs. And one of the guys looked at me and says, Well, you work at a church, the economy doesn't really affect what you do, right? And I'm like, Well, I mean, yeah doesn't affect like the day-to-day work that I do, but you realize churches like 100% of our income is like through people giving to the church, right? And so the economy affects all of that. It was like he had never thought about this before, but that's how the church works. And most churches, even their biggest, uh, the thing that they spend the most money on, probably most churches, about half of their budget is on the staff of the church. But that's where you, you should be thankful. I know I'm thankful for the amazing group of men and women that I get to go to work with every day. And men and women that are, because of your generosity, freed up to spend the best hours of their day serving the Lord by serving this church. 
that when a crisis comes up in the church, the pastors don't have to say, well, hey, I got to call in sick to my other job then so I can go help and deal with this. No, this is what we do. And whenever somebody in the church meets with me and they're like apologizing, well, I'm sorry for taking your time. I'm like, what do you think my time is for? This is exactly what it's for. And that's the way it should be in a church. Uh, think about then all the facilities or uh, the ministries, the programs that's, that are done at this church. We pay rent here uh, this morning. We'll rent out a, a charter school tonight for our student ministry and then the same one on Tuesday night for uh, life groups and adventure club. And we'll do that with another church on Thursday night. And then we'll rent this place out again for our men to come and gather next Saturday. How is that possible? Your generosity. Things like Camp Compass or, or Summer Camp, things that are subsidized by the church so that more people can attend. Uh, outreach events that we do, all of that is enabled by the generosity of God's people. That's how the local church works. And it's beautiful because every time you give, it's enabling other people to enjoy what you jo enjoy about this church. But that's not just true of the local church. It's also true of the global church. Even our church supports a ministry in Uganda, and we're hoping to add more ministry partners like that that are focused on uh, church planting or training of church leaders. And I was blessed to go there last month, and it's amazing to see what God is doing there. The, the thriving church that is there in this village in Uganda, a school servicing 600 kids in the community, a training center training up pastors to influence the whole nation. And it's amazing as I was walking around there, seeing all that they had done, even all that had been built to do this. And one of the questions I'm asking myself is, man, can this be self-supporting? Because you, you kind of think, well, I want it to be, but then you realize, no, it, it really can't. The scope of what they are trying to do is not possible just based out of that one village in Africa. And that's where it's good. It's God's design. It's a beautiful thing when churches like us in America can partner with ministries like that. And more than just beautiful, it's actually a biblical thing. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And you might want to keep kind of a bookmark or a uh, Something in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, because we'll go back and forth a couple times from there and Philippians. But 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul is talking to the church in Corinth about an offering they were kind of taking in Corinth to give to Christians in another part of the Roman Empire. And he says in 2 Corinthians 8, 13, For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that a, their abundance may supply your need and that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over and whoever gathered little had no lack. So here he's saying, hey, Corinthians, right now you're at a spot where you are blessed and you can provide for these believers in another part of the Roman Empire that are really going through a tough time. And however needy you might feel this morning, if you could compare our con congregation to the one that uh, met, well, now it's evening in Uganda, but the one that met today in Kuba Mitwe, Uganda, you would realize, okay, we've got a lot more than they do. And you would say, well, it's good, it's beautiful, it's appropriate then for us out of our abundance to help provide for their need and to supply for the ministry that's going on there. And those are more formal ways, but the Bible also speaks of many informal ways that generosity is a blessing. Think of um, the biblical instruction to show hospitality, to open up your home, or, or to bless those uh, brothers and sisters in Christ that are in need. Uh, and maybe just something that you know of, a friend or someone in your small group in church that you know there's a need and you can step up to meet that need. That is so necessary and it's beautiful. And this is all designed by God, but it's not as if God just said, you know what? I've got a great idea. I'll make them support each other. No, God actually modeled this for us. If you're still there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, just look back at uh, verse 9. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus modeled this for us. And we saw that already in Philippians. He did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he 
emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, by being born in human likeness. And not just that, but he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, so that we might be blessed. So that as it says in Ephesians, the passage we'll look at on Easter Sunday in Ephesians 2, so that in the ages to come, he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. If you are a Christian, you are filthy, stinking, rich in Christ because he became poor for us. And you will experience that riches into eternity, he says, the riches of his grace and of his kindness. So this is a necessity. This is how church works, but it's beautiful and it's been modeled for us by Jesus. And maybe even today, some of you need to hear, hey, Jesus Christ died so that he could make you rich. And that's not, as we'll get to a little bit later, you know, the, the perverted, this temporal riches and luxury in this world, but so that in eternity, he might welcome you into his kingdom. And he might bring you to be a part of his people. Today is the day to put your trust in this king who became poor for you and to really receive the riches of his grace. So we see how this is, a necessity, but then as we go back to Philippians, you see Paul really start to praise uh, this generosity. And he's clearly thankful for the gift, but he says, you know what? The best part is that you guys are going to benefit from this. And, and I think there's a real genuineness you can smell or you can sense about uh, Paul, you know, sometimes when somebody's complimenting you and sometimes it just comes across so phony, it just seems like the person's trying to, to butter you up and, hey, what do you want out of this? And it just feels like they're blowing smoke, the whole conversation with you. And you're like, I don't even know what they're saying. I'm choking on all the smoke, right? And then there's other people that you, they'll say something that might even be similar things to you, but you can just sense that there's a real genuine concern and there's a real care in them. And I think that's what you sense in Paul, when he says things like, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. He's like, man, I'm really glad that you guys have given because you're going to benefit from that. And that makes sense. Paul says, he quotes Jesus in Acts 20 by saying, it is better to give than to receive. And Paul said, man, I really believe that. And because, you know, then you guys have the better deal here because I'm receiving. But the, Jesus said, it's better to give. And so I'm excited for you and how you will be blessed in your giving. So this message today and this passage should not be merely informational. We're like, oh, that's cool how God designed things. No, we should say, I want to participate in that. I want to experience that. Point number two, seek the blessings of generosity. Seek the blessings of generosity. And that's what Paul goes on to describe in verses 17 through 19. And in each of those three verses, you're going to see just a gem. Each one has a, a, another truth about God and a truth about generosity that are all beautiful. And I want us to look at each of these three things. And let's start in verse 17, which I just read where Paul basically says, I'm more excited about how this gift is going to benefit you than how it has provided for me by saying, I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. And if you have the English Standard Version, there's a footnote that gives you a, another possible translation that I think is better because it fits. Paul is using very financial language here. He says, I seek the profit that accrues to your credit. He's saying, hey, by giving, you guys have made an investment. That, that is going to be worth it. So the first thing we see about generosity in verse 17 is it is rewarded by God. Generosity is rewarded by God. And, and this is where maybe some of you start to cringe because you remember the sushi you ate that had the bone in it. And, and you remember watching TV and, and, and seeing some preacher talk about some of these maybe same ideas in ways that just, didn't seem right because they weren't right. Because you're seeing some uh, 
teacher on some stage and you're like, why is all the furniture like plated with gold? What's up with that, right? And this preacher who flew on his private jet to get to this event and is now telling probably a group of impoverished people, hey, the secret to you overcoming the obstacles in your life is you just gotta have faith and you're gonna show that faith by giving. So our usher team is gonna come back and take a second offering and we're gonna hand out envelopes and what you gotta do is plant your seed of faith in that envelope and then bring it up to the front and we're gonna anoint it with oil and God's gonna bless your seed of faith 100 fold. And you've watched that and you're like, this is gross because you're right. It is gross for, for many reasons. Um, one reason that that is such an abomination is it really obscures the gospel. What's being taught in those moments is, hey, the secret to overcoming your obstacles is you giving to me. It's not. The, the secret to overcoming your obstacles is there is a God who loves you and sent Jesus Christ into this world to die for your sin, which, which by your way, is your biggest obstacle, so that you could be a part of his family and his kingdom and live forever with him in heaven. That, that's not even really getting talked about. Because it's all about your circumstances here and now. The gospel isn't even being preached. And if it is, it's a false gospel. Another reason why that's so twisted is it really does victimize people. A lot of this health, wealth, prosperity gospel is preying upon desperate people who will do anything just to have an ounce of hope in their life when it comes to either their financial troubles or serious medical problems or other uh, issues that they're having in their life. And they're being preyed upon by somebody who's selling them hope when it's actually just a get-rich scheme. But another reason why that kind of teaching is so bad is I think it does, for some people, spoil passages like this. Or when we read a passage like this, we basically think about, well, I know what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean what they're telling me on TV. But we never actually say, well, I can tell you what it does mean. And I am experiencing this. Because this is so twisted, I do want you to just pay attention to what God's word actually says. I mean, we see verse 17. Again, turn back with me to 2 Corinthians. And this will be our last time there. This time go to chapter 9. 2 Corinthians 9. And just listen, this is the word of God. It says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. There it reminds, God loves a cheerful giver and God is generous to those he sees being generous. And again, that, that gets twisted to even proportions of excess, right? Well, that's not what this is talking about, but it's a simple principle and it's a principle you should understand if you've ever had children, right? Your children, when they're young, everything they have is because you have given it to them. And when you see them being generous with what you have given to them, what does that do to your heart as a parent? You love that. And that makes you want to bless those kids even more. But when you see your kids being selfish with what you have given to them, right, it disgusts you. As a parent, and you say, No, 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 I'm creating a spoiled brat here, and I'm not gonna do that. I don't want them to be selfish with what I have given to them. Well, let's remember this whatever you have has been given to you by God. There is not one thing in your life that you can look at and say, I did that without the help of God. And even you're saying, Well, hey, no, I work really hard, and that may be true. And God does say He blesses hard work, but even Deuteronomy would remind us, Who gave you the ability to work? God did. Everything you have is a gift from God and your heavenly father loves seeing you be generous with what he has given you. And again, you you see again some of the faultiness of the false teachers, not reluctantly or under compulsion. No, we shouldn't have to take a second offering and manipulate you by putting it in an envelope and anointing it with oil. No, that's not how it should work. 
It's something that you do uh, because you want to do it. God loves a cheerful giver. And even here, the language, while it is strong, it talks about being bountiful. It also has the language of provision that you can have, verse 8, basically what you need at all times so that you may abound in every good work. God will bless you so that you can continue to serve him and be a blessing to others. That is uh, the, the truth of what the Bible teaches. And when we think about it being rewarded by God, it, it brings up a fair question. Okay, rewarded by God now in this life or re- rewarded by God later in the next life? Yes, I would say it would be what the Bible teaches. Both. that There are ways that God will bless generosity in this life. But the Bible also makes clear a big part of it is the blessing that is to come. And that's where I think, again, in a lot of the false teaching, the emphasis is exclusively on the now. Even just look at the language of the books that are written on this subject. Your best life when? Now. Uh, that's not the focus of the Bible. Your best life now. And just consider a few other verses. Uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Or you can just listen. If uh, We'll go to a couple verses here if it's too much flipping around for you. You can listen. But this is where Jesus teaches about Money and how we should think about this and look where he puts our perspective. Matthew 6, verse 19, Jesus says, familiar words, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Jesus is clearly putting their focus on eternity. It's not all about this life. This life is short. And he reminds you of something that maybe things like banks collapsing remind you of. Your wealth is not secure in this world. No matter how hard you work or how diligently you save, and even there's some biblical merit to those things, none of it is the sure thing. None of it is secure. And Jesus is saying, invest in heaven. How do you invest in heaven? I think if you look at the rest of what we've been reading in the Gospels, it's really through generosity. That's how you do it. And again, Jesus puts the emphasis on the future. One other passage that we'll read this week as we read through the Gospel of Luke. In Luke 14, he's talking about just, you know, some of the informal ways of being generous to others, just the way of hospitality. In Luke 14, 12, he says, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So even there, Jesus is putting the focus on eternity by saying, even when you do something as simple as show hospitality, invite someone to a party that you know there's no way on earth they're ever inviting me to something back, Jesus says, that'll be rewarded at the resurrection of the just. And part of the reason I think that these truths aren't appreciated is that the eternal aspect of this has been underemphasized. But here we see Paul just believing what he says. He knows that Jesus said it is better to give than to receive. So why would he not say that to the Philippians if he really believes it's better to give than to receive? Why would I or any pastor not preach on this if we really believe Jesus said it is better to give than to receive? And why should any Christian not say that's what I want to do because that's what Jesus has said? God says he loves this. He loves a cheerful giver. Why should we not seek to be that? Now, Paul goes back to the gift now back in Philippians 4, and he shifts from financial language to the language of of worship and sacrifice even. In verse 18, he says, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. And then he gets to the, the, the other language, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So there it even talks about something that pleases God. It uses the imagery of smell even. 
Uh, If you think about what went on at the temple, one of the things in the tabernacle and later in the temple that was always going on was the burning of incense, which was meant to give a a sweet aroma. Or especially men in the room, if you're like, I don't like incense. It smells too feminine or whatever. Okay, well, what was going on outside? Uh, The offering of sacrifices. Guys, do you like the smell of a barbecue? Yes, you do. So if you went around the temple, it was meant to be, even for your nose, a pleasing experience through the sacrifices being offered up, through the incense being burned. And we know that the point of that really is is meant to be a picture because we don't believe God has some literal nose and that he's going, oh, that smells good, right? We know it's meant to present a picture of things that please God. Psalm 141 speaks of our prayer being like incense to God, that God is pleased by our prayers, not their literal sense, but that's the picture. It's like it's an aroma pleasing to God. And this is saying that this is what you're giving and your generosity is like to God. That's the second thing there under point number two. Generosity is pleasing to God. It's pleasing to God. Again, this isn't literal, but it's, it's the imagery here that when you are generous, it's as if God is going, oh yeah, that smells good. Like some of you men will be when it's a warmer afternoon and you're firing up the grill and you're like, yes, grilling season has returned. What are we throwing on tonight? And you're smelling it all in saying, yes, this is good, right? That's how God feels when his people are generous, Right? Even now in, in church, earlier in the service, I referred to it as the offering. Well, no animals were injured in the taking of this morning's offering here at our church. Nothing was killed, nothing was cooked, and I, I genuinely hope that nothing smelled during the offering this morning. But God was going, oh, that's good. I love when my people are generous. Now, I think scripture would warn us about ways our offering can fail to please God. When we're not offering to God our best, as we see in Malachi, that doesn't please him. Or I think even looking at 2 Corinthians again, when it's not cheerful giving, when we are giving reluctantly or under compulsion, I don't think that pleases God. But when we are a cheerful giver like God calls us to be, he loves that. Now, why? Why does God love that? And I'd sum it up simply by saying this, because it shows that we trust him. That's what he loves about it. And, and, and also for the similar reasons that you would be pleased, right? When you see one of your kids sharing with one of your other kids, you go, ah, that smells good, right? Not literally to the smell, but it, it pleases you because you are seeing what you want to see in your children. And that is what God is seeing in us when we are generous. And one of the reasons that he is so pleased by that is because it does show that we trust him, it shows that we're, we're, we're sitting here parting with our possessions and our money and we're saying, God, you said it was better to give than to receive. And even though, can we just be honest, at a human level, that makes no sense. No, I, at a human level, I would much rather receive. But no, Jesus is telling me something countercultural. I believe you, Jesus, and I'm gonna practice that by giving. And I'm gonna believe that I will experience that blessing. And that faith honors God. Generosity, and especially like we saw in Luke 14, especially when there is no expectation of a return. And uh, let's realize a lot of worldly generosity, that's really what it is. Scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, right? But true Christian generosity, I'm giving to something that I'm not expecting anything in return from, that's an act of faith. And it's one that God says, it pleases me and it will be rewarded. And the, a baseline for all this, not only do I trust that it will be rewarded, I, I'm trusting ultimately even that reward, not looking like health and wealth and prosperity and all of that. I'm really trusting God's gonna provide for me. And that's what you see in verse 19, kind of this third gem. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. As if Paul is saying, guys, I'm so thankful for the gift. And you guys have supplied my need, and maybe they even did it to some extent at the expense of their own needs. And now Paul is saying, you know what? I know my God will supply your needs. The third thing there is generosity is enabled by his provision. It's enabled by God's provision. 
And there's so much meaning in each of these words here in verse 19. I love how Paul even speaks personally, and my God will supply. Paul knows who he's talking about. Because Paul can say, I've experienced this. God will provide for your need just like he's provided for all of my needs. And let's remember, he's not writing this from the the beach villa. He's writing this from prison. And that's what he would say is the generosity of God. So again, the generosity of God does not look like what the health wealth preachers or what the world want to make it out to be. But Paul can still say, my God will supply. It doesn't say that he might supply. No, he will supply every need of yours. And that's another corrective, again, to the, much of the false ways of thinking. He doesn't say every, he'll make all your dreams come true. Right? Every wish of yours will be granted. This is not a Disney movie. This is the word of God. He will supply every need of yours. And that's where even last week, we probably need to reassess what re- our needs really are. But that doesn't mean that God is just going to give you the, the, the bare minimum. No, he will provide, it says, according to his riches. It doesn't say out of his riches, as if, oh, God has a lot, so he's got enough to give you. No, he will supply your needs according to his riches. God loves to provide generously for his kids. And again, that's where Paul can say that with a straight face while he's in jail, right? Even him being in jail, he's still saying, man, God has been so generous to me, even though that wouldn't fit the worldly definitions of success, And and he will supply every need of yours according to his riches in Christ Jesus. That's really the the real root and source of the provision that God will bring to you. And and, and that's important because maybe earlier when I said he will supply every need of yours, you were maybe asking a fair question and saying, so are we saying then that over the last 2,000 years since Paul wrote this, that there hasn't been one Christian all around the world that has died from starvation over those last 200 years? Well, I'll one-up you on that. Do you know what? Actually, every Christian since Paul wrote this has died. Every single one, right? We will all die at some point. And that's where, what do we really need? You need a resurrection is what you need. You need new life. You need eternal life that extends beyond the grave. Where are you going to get that? Only in Jesus Christ. Only in Jesus Christ. That is our deepest need. And that's what Paul is saying. Every Christian will have met. Paul is saying, hey, as long as God wants me serving him here on this earth, he's going to provide for me according to his riches. And when he thinks my work is done, then he's going to provide a way to glory in Christ. All my needs will be met in Christ. And even as I mentioned earlier, as we continue in this taking ground project, can't we say, isn't God good? Can't we say God has generously met the needs of this church, even giving us this bigger space to meet in? And can't we have every confidence that my God will supply every need of ours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus? It's so good. And you know what? God's gonna use our generosity to help us get there. And I bet at some point, even above and beyond just the faithfulness of the people of this church, God's gonna do some other things, some clear open doors, God things, so that when someday we're worshiping somewhere else, we'll look back and say, yeah, hasn't God been great? And look at what he did. So consider those three gems, right? God rewards generosity. God is pleased by generosity. And God enables generosity by trusting, I will take care of you. And that's where I really do want you to seek the blessings of generosity. And there's not one imperative word. There's not one command in our text this morning. But boy, would we be missing the point if we could understand all this and not say, man, I want to be generous. I want to respond and I want to experience this. And so I want to encourage you. You should start by giving to your 
local church. And if you belong to this church, God wants you to be generous as a part of a church family. You should be mindful of how can I bless works of God in other ways, whether it's missions or other ministries that I may need support. You should seek me. How can I be generous and hospitable to other people in this church? How can I make sure uh, some of my hospitality is going towards people that can't do anything to repay me? How can I be generous to the jerk at my work who I know will never pay me back, but I can show the grace of God to him. If we're not seeking to do all those things and asking all those questions, we have missed the point of this passage. You cannot outgive the giver, as the old saying goes. And I dare you to spend the rest of your life trying and see how God will be faithful. And my fear is that many, even in more conservative circles in America, We want to say, well, I got to figure out my finances first. I got to hit some point in life of financial stability, and then I'll give. I think God actually turns that around and says, hey, you be generous, and I'll take care of the financial stability, and I will meet your needs. And again, you're not doing that in a way to try to manipulate God, right? And that's really another one of the tragedies of all this health, wealth, prosperity nonsense is it puts us in the exalted place and makes God our humble servant instead of the other way around with God being exalted and we are his humble servants and we're seeking to serve him and trusting that he will give us what we need. No, we're trying to honor And especially young people in the service this morning, I'd encourage you to start to make this a practice in your life. I still remember being a high school student. I was on summer vacation and was at some other church, Pastor Cliff at some church in Los Altos, California, teaching on generosity. I remember hearing, I was like, man, if if the Bible says that about being generous, then I want in on that. And maybe you're a young person, you're thinking, well, I, I can't really give much. I could give like a dollar. Great. You know what? If that's really what is on your heart and you give that cheerfully to the Lord, God's saying, man, I love that. And maybe some of you that are older are thinking, man, I don't have much to give. Clearly the Bible makes it clear. It's not about the amount. That's not what it's about. It's about the heart behind it. And God loves that. And God blesses that. You know, I really don't care if you like sushi or not. You can take it or leave it. But I do care that you understand and know the true blessings, not the false ones, the true blessings of Christian generosity. And if that's been twisted and you never heard that explained before, I hope you really taste and see what it's really all about and that you see the goodness and the generosity of God to be more than you could ever imagine. Let's pray together.